Hey, good morning. Sorry I was running a little late today. I couldn't find my iPad. I have no idea where I set it. Things have been a little busier around the Mulholland house than normal. Um, Lori, good morning. Glad to see you today. Roseanne, hi. Hope your morning's going well. Other Lori, hope you're doing good this morning. Um, things are going, yeah, things are going really well here. Anne is resting. She had a good night last night and is taking all of her meds that she's supposed to take. And she sat at the dinner table last night while we were eating. And that was, <clears throat> that was really nice. And other than that, she's just taking it easy, which is what the doctor told her to do. So we're making sure that she's, um, that she's doing that. Uh, Anne's sister is still here with us and is being helpful, and we appreciate that. Um, I, we've just appreciated all of the thoughts and prayers and all of your, uh, all of for those of you on Facebook, for all of your um, Facebook comments. And I had, you know, yesterday we sent out that text, um, which many of you um, hopefully got. We sent out that text about our Christmas Eve service, our Christmas Eve gathering, and I had many people respond back and ask how Anne was, and that was nice. So we're just really thankful and appreciative of, uh, of your care for, for her and for our family during this time. So thanks. Um, good morning to uh, Scott and Ruth. Good morning, Ruth. Glad you're on with us today. We're continuing our read and our study through um, through Mark chapter 12, and I hope you had a chance to take a look at that um, before now. And if you haven't, that's okay because we're going to read it together. Um, remember the remember all of the context for this. This is the last week of Jesus's life, and um, he's being, at least the way, at least the way Mark presents it, he is being barraged with all sorts of questions and concerns in his last week. Um, so there's lots of, yeah, there's lots of questions and concerns and gatherings of people that are, um, all around him and surrounding him. And he has, um, so he's just had a few really important um, conversations with people. Um, yesterday, he, well, not yesterday, but yesterday we talked about um, questions that he received about the resurrection. Um, he's talked about taxes and giving to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. He's given the, he's given the story of the vineyard and the farmers and the Pharisees knew that he was talking about them. Um, so just a lot of, a lot of really heavy teaching, um, in going on in this week. So, so after he has talked to the Pharisees and the Herodians about Caesar and taxes, he talks to the Sadducees about the resurrection. And there was someone that was standing by, a religious leader, a teacher of the religious law, was standing around and he was kind of listening to all of this conversation. And that's where we pick up in Mark 12, verse 28. One of the teachers of religious law was standing there listening to the debate. He realized that Jesus had answered well. So he, this person was impressed with all of the things that Jesus had been saying and the way that he dealt with all of these questions he was receiving. He realized that Jesus answered well, so he asked, Of all the commandments, which one is the most important. So remember the context of Mark 12 is there are several times in Mark 12, and we haven't gotten to them all yet, but several times in Mark 12, Jesus's answer to questions that he gets is, well, what do the scriptures say? What does, we would say, what does the Bible say? So what do the scriptures say about that? So, um, how do we answer questions according to what the Bible says? 
um, in that little first section where he's talking about the, the vineyard and the evil farmers. Um, he says, don't you ever read the scriptures. Um, yesterday, we talked about this um, from the Sadducees. Uh, your mistake is that you don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. Now, here's someone who's coming, and this person is asking kind of a question of Jesus. Of all the commandments, which is the most important? So, in his own way, this person has sort of flipped the script on Jesus, and he is asking Jesus, okay, Jesus, which is the greatest commandment? So when you read the scripture, Jesus, now that, that phrase isn't in the text, but that's what's going on here. When you read the scriptures, what's the greatest commandment? How is Jesus going to answer, right? Well, verse 29, the most important commandment is this. Listen, O Lord, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord, and you must love him, Lord your God, with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. So that is... That is, the, that is Deuteronomy 6, um, verses, I think verses 4 to 6. Um, so Jesus answers this question about what is the greatest commandment. He answers it, notice, with Scripture. Okay? So this is different than <clears throat> the way he has talked and asked questions about Scripture of those who are asking him and coming to him with all of these concerns. He's flat out telling them, you guys don't know, you don't know the scriptures, you don't know the Bible, or what does the scripture have to say? So here he gets asked this question, what's the most important commandment? It's really important to notice that Jesus' answer is from the scripture. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. Right? So completely love God. The second, now some translations are going to word this a little differently. The NLT says the second is equally important. Um, other verse, other translations like the NIV, the New American Standard, um, maybe the ESV, they're going to say something like, and the second is like it. Right? So there's a little bit of a difference. Um, so <clears throat> Jesus is not saying that the second commandment is exactly like the first because okay, there's a little bit of a hierarchy. We want to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. But the second is equally important. That's how the NLT writes it. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than this. And what I want you to know, just like love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, that's scripture. That's from the Old Testament. That's from Deuteronomy. Love your neighbor as yourself is also scripture. It's also Old Testament, but it's not Deuteronomy. That one is found in Leviticus 19.18. So don't miss out here that in this text, when Jesus is asked these questions about the greatest commandment, his default switch is to tell them Scripture. His default um, mindset is the Bible. Well, this is what the Bible has to say, right? So, just like I said um, a few times this week um, already, you know, imagine what it would be like for you to come to myself or one of the other pastors or one of the elders and ask a question. Imagine if our answer was, well, what does the Bible have to say about that? That would be the most biblical thing we could probably do is point you to scripture or when you ask us a question about that about something that, that scripture clearly speaks to what would it be like and i'm not saying we don't do this but what would it be like for us to just quote a bible verse to you um like i'll just i'll confess something to you um There are times where I am, there are times where I'm just uncomfortable at giving people Bible verses. And my discomfort with that is, is I feel like in our time, um, people, 
Like, people have used Bible verses um, as like a, as a bludgeon, right? So, so I'm going to quote a Bible verse to you, and I'm going to beat you up with it. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to quote Bible verses. I'm not going to actually give you anything practical in real life. I'm just going to quote Bible verses at you. And, like, I believe that all scriptures God breathed, useful teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness, just like, just like, the, just like it says, um, that's 2 Timothy. Um, like, I believe, you know, I believe that's true. And, and, and this is just confession time because my discomfort isn't with the Bible. My discomfort is with myself. And I wonder sometimes if that's because I'm not so sure if I believe Scripture really has the power I say it does. Does that make sense? Um, like, I intellectually agree that the Bible is all of the things that it says it is. And there are times where I, like, I guess this is one of those, of course I have faith, give me faith moments. Um, there are times where, where I'm just not sure if the Bible's enough. And I need to get over that. Like, plain and simply, um, I, need to, I need to get over that moment and be comfortable and confident in proclaiming the truth of Scripture to people in their lives. Um, and Jesus, like, you know, Jesus is not, Jesus is not bound by my little hang-up <laughs> about what the Bible is. And I, um, that's one of the things I really love about him, is he's just not bound by that. So something that, something that I need to be better at, and, and maybe, maybe this is something for you to be thinking about as well, is how, how, how do you use Scripture? How do you utilize Scripture? I think there's a way to utilize Scripture without it being a bludgeon. Because the last thing, the last thing I want to do is be, um, is be Bible quote guy. Um, and actually, that's not the last thing I want to do. Um, the second to the last thing that I want to be is Bible quote guy. The thing that the, the guy that I don't want to be is the one that never gives the Bible. That never shares the real answer and the real truth with someone else when I know that that's what they need to hear. So I think a good thing is like um, pray for that sensitivity. Like, is this a time for me to pull out a Bible verse? Um, is this a time for me maybe to talk about a biblical principle? Is this a way and a time for me to show love to someone? And I can do that like using scripture. Um, I can do that not using scripture. And I think all of this, like this probably maybe sounds a little confusing, but I just, I get torn sometimes about when to tell someone something from scripture. And um, I, I think that part of that mindset is... Um, Knowing the other person, um, knowing how to how to use scripture correctly, and that's like the part where it's a, it can be a bludgeon. Um, you know, the guy standing on the street corner that says "repent or die." Um, there might be truth to that, but it, there also may not be very much love in it. And we have like when 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 we've been reading through chapter twelve here. I don't think Jesus. When he was asking his questions, well, what do the scriptures say? Or haven't you ever read the scriptures? He's not using it as, he's not using it as a bludgeon. He's doing that because he wants them to truly see and understand all of the things that are going on in scripture that he's been talking about in his life. And I think if we go way back, way back several weeks ago to what else we've read in Mark when he's talked about seeing and not understanding or having eyes and not seeing, having ears and not hearing, and having a mind and not understanding. He's really trying to get them to think deeper and engage more consistently and more clearly with the scriptures. So, like, if my, if my goal, um, if my goal is to love someone, 
I want to be like, and so Jen just posted this. Jen just made this great comment. Um, just because it's a double-edged sword doesn't mean you should stab people with it. Exactly. Right? And the way that I've talked about that exact text is because it's a double-edged sword, because it is um, God-breathed, because it has the power to teach and correct and rebuke and train in righteousness, because it has the ability to cut through bone and marrow to like the very heart of a person, like I want to be very careful with that tool, right? It's not something, the Bible's not a sword I should just be waving around on people, right? I want to be careful. And I think that's exactly what we see happening here. As Jesus has asked this question, he utilizes scripture, and then he provides like a little bit of context for it. He says, no, no other commandment is greater than these. So he's asked a very direct question about scripture, and he answers with scripture. The teacher of religious law replied, well, said teacher, you've spoken the truth by saying there's only one God and no other. And I know it's important to love him with all my heart and all my understanding and all my strength and to love my neighbor as myself. This is more important than to offer all of the burnt offerings and sacrifices required in the law. Now I want you to notice that, notice this person's response to what Jesus said. This is different than, certainly it's different than, than the responses that we've seen elsewhere in chapter 12, right? Jesus uses scripture, and um, when Jesus told the, the parable of the vineyard at the beginning of the chapter, um, the religious leaders wanted to arrest Jesus, but they realized he was telling the story against them. They were wicked. They were the wicked farmers, but they were afraid, so they left him. Like, this guy is not doing that, right? So there's something going on in this person's heart and mind, a humility that's being demonstrated by this person where he's like, oh, yeah. Like, I can, I told Jesus, what you have said from the scriptures is truth. And this is how I have tried to live my life. And I think when we compare that to, to so many other ways the Pharisees and the teachers of the law have consistently responded to Jesus by getting angry, wanting to murder him, um, wanting to have him arrested, um, conspiring against him, this guy doesn't do that. And then Jesus says, um, Jesus says this, realizing how much the man understood, Jesus said to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. So I think, I think one of the things that we can kind of run from this text is, is there's, the, there's a way to utilize the sword of the Spirit. There's a way to utilize God's Word in a way that builds people up and encourages them challenges them, of course, calls them to repentance. There's a way to utilize God's word in every single one of those ways. And that is, and when we use God's word that way, um, and, our, and our heart is, is correct, then, I, then God will bring about life change in that person. We'll just, we'll, we're going to give all the credit to him because it's not about how we, how, what we do. Um, but when we utilize that tool correctly, then, then we see fruit of that. Um, and when we utilize that tool of the Bible incorrectly, we also see fruit of that. But that's not the fruit that we want. Um, so this, for, like for us as we think about this... Um, it's this question that Jesus asks throughout Mark 12. Have you read the scriptures? How are you reading the scriptures? Are you just reading the scriptures to gain all of this Bible knowledge so you can pull your sword out and cut someone to pieces? Are you reading the scriptures for life change? We talked about this yesterday. Like, is this information or transformation? And if our goal in people's lives... When we, are, when, when we enter into their hardships and realities and situations and circumstances, when we enter into those spaces with them, the mindset of the believer ought to be one of pointing them to Christ. 
to keep our hearts correct. And one of the things that we must then do is understand what the scriptures are. And not just say them as a sword, not just throw them out there, not a, not a platitude. We've talked about spiritual platitudes before, right? Saying the right thing because it's the right thing to say. When I was in student ministry, I called that the Jesus answer, right? We don't just give out the Jesus answer. And it kind of sounds like what's interesting in this man, what in this teacher of religious laws reply to Jesus, it kind of sounds like he's giving some platitudes. You've spoken the truth, saying there's only one God and no other. I know it's important to love him with my heart, mind, soul, and strength. And I love my neighbor. Like, that sounds a little like he's giving the Jesus answer, like he's giving platitudes. But we know he's not because of what Jesus says, because of how Jesus responds. You're not far from the kingdom of God. You get it. Your, your attitude, your, your spirit, like you are demonstrating humility in what you're saying. And you're not far from God's kingdom. And what I would love for, for each of you is that you would not be far from God's kingdom. That you would demonstrate the same level of, of humility and um, grace and teachability that this teacher of the law, don't miss that. Like this guy's a teacher of the law. Um, and he is demonstrating the ability to learn. And I think that's something that sometimes we can miss, right? Because we, as Christians, we we have the truth. We are a, we know what reality is. And I don't know about you, but I've run into some I've run into some Christians that are not teachable, that are not humble, um, that think they have the whole thing figured out, and that is not the posture of this person. This is the heart and the posture of someone who um, who understands what Jesus is saying and wants to live by it and is on a path. And I love that you're not far from the kingdom of God. And I think if we can teach humbly. And um, I think if we teach humbly, we are not far from God's kingdom. And if we receive humbly, we also are not far from God's kingdom. So I would encourage you, um, when you are, <clears throat> when you're talking, some, talking to someone, be bold, proclaim truth to them, share scripture, and do it from with a posture of love, not judgment. Because Jesus is not judging this man. He asked him a question about the scriptures, and the man and Jesus gave the answer about the scriptures. And he didn't use it as a tool to beat the guy up. He used it as a tool to love him. And then he was able to say, dude, you're not far from God's kingdom. Like, you get what we're talking about here. And I love it when that happens. Like, that's one of my favorite things, is when I do utilize scripture in this way. And like I can see that people are actually grasping because of the power of the Spirit, they're actually grasping what's going on. So those are some things to think about from this text today. Um, we should uh, we should pray together. So let's do that. God, we're thankful for your Son Jesus. We're thankful for His example of utilizing Scripture in a way that brings you honor and brings you glory, and um, also leads to leads to life change. Um, help us to be familiar with Scripture. Help us to desire the transformation um, that, that is ultimately coming from your Spirit, utilizing the Scriptures as the means of that transformation. So we are thankful for that. Help us to read Scripture um, to be transformed. And then I pray that each one of us today would have an opportunity to share Scripture with someone. I pray that each one of us would be looking for opportunities to share Scripture with someone. And in order for us to do that, we have to know Scripture. We have to know what it says. We have to have the information. And we also have to have a demonstration of transformation in our lives. So God, help each one of us today to be looking for opportunities to share Scripture, to not use it as a bludgeon, but use it as a tool to point people to you and to reveal your glory. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.
Well, I am thankful for you guys. Got the mohawk going. I'm thankful for you guys. Um, appreciate you. I appreciate your time um, that you would come on here on a Wednesday and hear. We had two 30 minute sermon days in a row. Um, I'm so thankful that you guys uh, came on and watched uh, today. And I want you to know that I love you and I'm praying with you and I'm praying for you today. Certainly appreciate your prayers for, for us and for our family. Um, as we go through this time, as we go through the next few weeks, um, certain to face all sorts of different um, challenges and trials. Um, so we appreciate your prayers. And I don't think there's any, I don't think we're going to have any major updates today about anything that, that um, is going on with Anne. So, um, yeah, so I probably won't post anything today. Um, so, so, but thank you for your prayers. Um, we absolutely mean them. Um, and we are feeling them. We know that you are praying with us and you're praying for us. So uh, don't forget this Sunday is um, Ho-Cho-Koo, Hot Chocolate and Cookies. Uh, immediately following our 1015, we'll have Hot Chocolate and Cookies. And then next week, you should have received notification about this. Um, next week on Thursday, December 24th, which is Christmas Eve, we are doing an online-only stream. Um, gathering for Christmas Eve. We are not meeting in person um, on Christmas Eve, and I know that's a bummer. It's a bummer for me. I really wish we were, and that's just not our reality right now, and that's okay. Um, this is an opportunity for us to engage God's Word and engage in song and spend time with our families just in a little different way, and um, and it, it, you know what? It's just going to be awesome. I'm excited for it. So, um, so next week, uh, Christmas Eve is online only. That'll be on our YouTube channel, and um, there's more information about that. If you look in the weekly email that you're going to get today, um, just go to westwaychurch.com. Uh, You'll see a Christmas Eve tab up there. You can click on that for more information. So we love you guys, and I'm looking forward to seeing you tomorrow morning again at 7 a.m. We'll pick up right where we left off in Mark chapter 12. Um, verses, let's see, I'm going to close my Bible. Mark chapter 12, uh, verse 35, and I would recommend highly to you that you read all of Mark chapter 12. Remember to keep all of this flow and context going um, about what the scriptures have to say. Love you guys. See you tomorrow morning.